I ended my last lecture with this iconic painting. I hope you had a chance to watch some of the excellent video discussing this work. Let me make just a few additional points. The tricorn hat, circled in green, was a symbol of the French Revolution. Also, Delacroix signed the painting on the barricades. I've circled the signature in red, drawing attention to this, again, iconic element of the revolution. In the 1850s, after another street-led revolution in 1848, the French political leadership enlisted the architect Haussmann to remake Paris into the city of wide, tree-lined avenues we enjoy today. The alleged goal was to make the city more sanitary and beautiful. The unspoken goal was to make it harder for the riffraff to throw up barricades. Note that Delacroix rendered the allegorical figure of victory quite unallegorically. Art critics at the time were not dismayed by her bare breasts, nothing new there, but they were dismayed by the dirt on her dress and the way she thrust herself into the midst of battle rather than hovering decorously in the air. The newly installed bourgeois king, Louis Philippe, bought the painting and hung it in the palace gallery. After the Parisian mob staged another rebellion in 1832, the king had the painting taken down and returned to Delacroix. When the revolution of 1840, leading the people, came out of storage and was actually displayed in the Academy Salon of 1855. In 1874, it entered the collection at the Louvre, where it is now one of France's most cherished images. I'll flip through just a few more works by Delacroix, both to prepare you for possible attribution questions and to illustrate further elements of Romanticism. This story comes from a poem by the great Romantic poet Lord Byron, and the setting is the ever-popular exotic Near East. An Assyrian king has learned that his armies have been defeated, so he has his guards kill off his women, slaves, and horses. More Orientalism with the usual dose of sex and horror to keep our interest. Here we see the fascination with Orientalism combined with headline news. In 1822, inhabitants of the Greek island of Chios tried to join the Greek War of Independence. Ottoman Turks invaded the island and killed or enslaved tens of thousands of islanders. The war fascinated and horrified the classically attuned Western European elites. The romantic po poet Byron would die fighting for Greece. Here's another element of Romanticism, which we saw in the Raft of Medusa and in Liberty Leading the People. Romantic painters often chose current events and what they saw as ongoing injustice as the subject of their work. And here we see uh, some paintings Delacroix made after a visit to North Africa in 1832. Note the dangerous power of nature, another popular romantic theme. Okay, German Romanticism fell off the list, but I cannot ignore this famous painting altogether. Germany was the epicenter of a particularly gloomy and dramatic form of Romanticism, represented above all by the great poet and dramatist Goethe. His work inspired a cult of the solitary, sorrowful, romantic young man seeking the meaning of life in an often unforgiving nature, and here he is same artist. Look closely and you will see a shipwreck, once again highlighting the eternal struggle between man and nature and news. I love the rhythm of this painting, by the way, with its strong parallel diagonals and, of course, pyramidal composition. The English romantics were just as enamored of nature and just as eager to get in touch with their feelings, but they were far too British to engage in a lot of German angst. You'd never guess it from this painting, but we're, what we're seeing here is a response to the other great set of 19th century revolutions, usually lumped together under the term Industrial Revolution. Artists such as Constable were mostly dismayed by industrialization's impact on the countryside, especially the displaced agricultural workers and the increasing pollution. Here, Constable seeks to recapture the rural simplicity of his childhood. Okay, enough recapping and detouring. Here's our next required work. I actually have an excuse for hanging on to my Friedrich and Constable slides. I want to ask what's different about the Oxbow, probably the most famous painting of the so-called Hudson River School. And for that matter, what might be different about American Romanticism? I think this quote offers a pretty strong clue. While Cole is also addressing the sublime and even uses the term sublime in his, in his American context, 
he is referring to more to nature's beauty than its terrors. Note the word birthright. Art historians associate coal with the notion of manifest destiny, the idea that God had given this land to Americans to settle. Cole painted this work partly in response to a British art critic who claimed that Americans didn't pay attention to their own scenery. But note that Cole reveals some of his own mixed feeling about human settlement. The quite, this painting quite deliberately contrasts the raw beauty of nature with the still lovely but much plainer settled land on the right. Is this a tribute to the way Americans have tamed nature and made it fruitful, or do we detect a note of regret? Where, after all, has the artist chosen to hang out? That's his self-portrait that I've circled in red. Well, as we see from this close-up, he has chosen to hang out in the wilderness, not in the Arcadian settlement. So what do you notice about the brush strokes? We're seeing more of those loose daubs of bright color. Uh, Cole also illustrated James Fenimore Cooper's Last of the Mohicans, which mourned the passing of the noble savage, one of Rousseau's favorite themes. This too suggests at least a little ambiguity about progress. Some art historians think that Cole left a hidden message in the oxbow. Uh, the word Noah is roughly incised in Hebrew letters. A code that read upside down spells out Shaddai, the Almighty. So the landscape isn't just an American birthright, it's a beautiful element of God's creation. Romantic pain religion, but this was especially true in the United States, where rebellion against religion was not as major an element of the Enlightenment. Since we live in the West, I have to throw in another famous American landscape painter who is sometimes associated with the Hudson River School, even though he mostly painted California, Sierra Nevada mountains. This too is nature sublime, but not as terrifying. Here's another beer stop painting, this time with human figures portrayed as noble pioneers fulfilling the call to settle America from sea to sea. Again, we see manifest destiny, a point that has shown up on past AP exams, hint, hint. So this Mexican artist painted 50 years after the Oxbow. This is a required work, by the way. But I think you'll see some important similarities. And what are they? Well, there are a lot of compositional similarities. The bird's eye view, the contrast between wilderness and civilization, the hillside in the foreground, the thunderstorm receding in the distance, the tiny figures captured in the wild portion of the painting, and this too is a nationalist work asserting a Mexican vision of nature and history. Velasco probably understood what he was looking at better than Cole did before entering the Academy of San Carlos, which was the first art academy and the first art museum in the Americas. He studied zoology and botany at the nearby medical school. I know I'm repeating the Khan Academy video you watched, or I hope you watched, but in the distance we see important historical landmarks. Again, this is a nationalist painting. Circled in red <clears throat> is the Basilica of Guadalupe, next to the hill of Tepeyac, where the Virgin of Guadalupe appeared to Juan Diego. The roads marked out in purple are the ancient Aztec causeways, now Mexican roads leading into Mexico City. The ancient Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan was built on Lake Texcoco, circled in green and receding under the pressure of agricultural and industrial development. It's mostly disappeared now. And here we see the ancient volcanoes that, according to Aztec legend, represented two ill-fated lovers, an Aztec princess and a courageous warrior. The Khan Academy experts pronounce the names, I'm not that brave. The similarities in the two paintings are probably not accidental. Velasco would have known American landscape painting, and like Cole, he was making a patriotic point about his nation's beautiful landscape and dramatic history. On to our final Romanticism lecture. <laughs>